So this episode is a bit of a departure. Instead of focusing on music creation or mixing, I'm going to take you on a deep dive into the making of a music video. Specifically, we're going to look back at the music video for Failure Stuck on You. This video was made 24 years ago, but to me, it still holds up. When we recently found all the master tapes for Failure's 390s albums, we also stumbled upon the original 16mm film for this music video. And that led me to looking up Phil Harder, who directed the video back in 1996. How you doing, Ken? I'm doing good. Yeah, long time no see. Long time. I tracked you down maybe a, a couple of weeks ago because I wanted you to see and talk to you about the fact that we found the original camera negative from the Stuck On You video, which you directed in 1996. And maybe just some quick background on you. You kind of made a transition from being uh, a guy in a band to being a director. Well, in the mid-80s, I was in a band called Breaking Circus. They were on Homestead Records, and uh, I met a lot of my favorite bands at the time. I kind of wanted to be a filmmaker, but I wanted to be a musician first. And, you know, we were doing okay, but I carried a Super 8 camera and started filming these bands that I knew. One of my first music videos was for Naked Reagan. And from there, I got a 16 millimeter camera. I started doing more and more music videos, building my reel. And as my music video career went up, my music career went down. After uh, about 10 years of that, I was about 95, and I had a hit with uh, Corner Shop Brimful of Asha. And uh, right after that, I did uh, the video for you guys. And we brought you to Minneapolis because um, it was a really complicated shoot and I wanted to work with a lot of people I knew. And also we knew we could put the budget on the screen. You know, when you shoot in New York and LA, which I do a lot, it really eats up the budget. We needed to stretch everything we had. Even though it was a very nice budget, we had a really complicated shoot with a massive post-production. You know, post-production then costs a lot. You couldn't do that stuff at home. But I was so impressed when you called me and you actually sent me um, something you were working on. It was still in bits and pieces. And I saw what you were working on with like little boxes and squares in the corners. You're syncing up everything. And now I've just seen the, the uh, finished product where you updated it to this really high resolution um, video. And my God, Ken, I can't believe you pulled that off. It looks amazing. If anybody would appreciate it, you would appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm geeking out on it, man. So... I'm geeking out on the storyboards that you sent. Thanks to um, Rick Fuller, who uh, was the producer, Harder Fuller Films. I've known him since 85. And uh, he keeps all that stuff, all that material is archived. You know, you look at the first page and you're like, okay, there's probably going to be like maybe three or four pages. And then you just keep going and going and going. And everything in the video is in these storyboards. We felt... We had such a beautiful video. I remember it was at Pixel Farm in Minneapolis, Kurt Angel and Randy Gaxtetter. And every time they'd pause the um, video to you know, work on something, it looked like a movie poster. Mm -hmm. It just looks so awesome. The stills, and when I see yeah. that on the screen, I'm just like, man, this is going to be a great video. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a lot. Every frame is like a, a composed. There wasn't, mm -hmm. um, you weren't just kind of like setting up a situation and hoping you might get some magic. I mean, in a way, with the trampoline stuff, yeah. Like, because you didn't mm -hmm. know what they were going to do every jump. Yeah. So you'd have to shoot a lot of stuff. But like with the band, it was like all very composed. The way that you actually um, positioned us, especially in that first band uh, wide shot reveal where we come off the kick drum, the way you had positioned us relationally, I remember you doing that and it didn't feel right to me when I was on the set. I felt way too far forward. Like, where's my band? <laughs> and I thought Greg and Troy were way too far to the sides. But then when I saw your frame on, on playback, maybe, or maybe in post, I was mm -hmm. like, wow, it's so... Um, it's just such a strong frame. To me, that's a classic music video shot. I learned that from Chuck Statler, who did all these Devo videos and Elvis Costello madness. 
And you really have to fill that panoramic uh, frame. So, you know, the positioning, the drums, all these, you know, someone forward, someone back, all these things, that really makes that panoramic frame work. Back in 96, um, when I was uh, first talking to you on the phone, we were talking about our love for, like, the 70s era Bond title sequences, and that's what this whole video is an homage to. It's really an homage to Maurice Binder, who I, I think did almost every Bond title sequence from, like, late 60s right through the mid-80s, I think. So I made a VHS edit myself of, you know, the spy who loved me cut over the song. What we did is we replaced the gun motif, which is an all bond intros through Maurice Bender. They always use the gun as this phallus, this, this people dancing, walking on the gun, pointing it, turning it, touching it sexually. And we used the microphone, we used the cymbals, we used the guitars, we used everything instrumental to replace the gun, since it's a music video. When I first heard the song, it's got this kind of really beautiful slow beat, but it gets really heavy. Um, it went so well with that Bond slow motion, with the women running in slow motion with the silhouettes. And it was also something I was kind of familiar with doing with some of the earlier videos, like I mentioned, The Corner Shop, where we're doing these layered effects. But this took it to another level. And with the stars of optically printed title sequences, such as Maurice Bender or Sal Bass, who did um, all the Hitchcock intros, we studied that. Um, we studied the technique, the frame rates, everything to get it right. And we were using, even though we were shooting on film, in 96 we were using digital technology to edit. We were doing that post. We'd take all the film negatives, the ones you found, and we transfer them to digital and edit digitally. But we were studying exactly the way things move, the silhouettes, even the backgrounds, like the smoky backgrounds, the light um, beams, all these things, because the entire video is not just color, it also has textures. So with 16 millimeter slow motion, we shot a ton of backgrounds as well. And with all those elements, we shot everything in about two or three days, and then went to work for weeks in post. And that's where you really came in, Ken and helped out on that. What was interesting when we um, shot that, and the viewers might not know this, we had to do everything at hyper speed because we we're shooting slow motion. Yeah. So if the song is like three or four minutes long, sometimes we're doing it double speed, sometimes we're doing it triple speed. Um, sometimes the song would only last about 45 seconds because you guys are going at hyper speed. So everything we did from pulling the camera back from the bass drum all the way back to that wide shot that you mentioned earlier, that was like a, that, you know, we were like, roll music, it's going really fast. Roll camera. Here's a camera with a magazine with film in it. It goes, <laughs> it's going so fast. And then someone yells, speed, action. The dolly pulls back and literally like two seconds, like, Whoa. that was a crazy shoot. We had to time everything exactly and it's really hard to do when you're doing that slow motion hyperspeed. Nowadays, you know, pretty much everything is shot on shot on video cameras, but they, you know, the newer, nicer ones look very filmic, so it's all good. But the cool thing about shooting that is that you can watch playback in high quality while you're on set, right? This was shooting 16 millimeter film. Did we have any kind of playback on the set? Yeah, there's those little um they the eyepieces have little cheap video cameras on them so you can have a, a playback. But the thing about it is I don't think we could watch it in slow motion. It's not like we're watching it with the slow motion and the song all playing at the right speed. The craft of filmmaking, imagine, you know, even in the days before video assist, you know, they're making tons of movies, they're getting it right. They just know they have to have everything in place and, and really be um, on it because they can't make a whole film and then get the film back and say, oh, it sucked. When you roll film, it's really expensive. It's like money going through the magazine. So you really take a lot of care to prepare stuff beforehand. I mean, that was ingrained in my head for already like a dozen years, you know? Every ounce of film I shot was like gold. Creates a certain like intensity on set to know that when you say, roll it's for real there's no mm -hmm. this isn't playtime anymore it's like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. everyone that has to be on it and like paying attention i noticed with some of the students that i've worked with since that came up in digital 
they shoot a lot of lot of material, but they just try to th put it together in post. There's not a lot of prep. And what I tried to teach was um, the preparation because I know I learned through the value of you know a small amount of film for a music video when I started out that I had to make every shot count. And I think that's why we storyboarded everything, not to mention there's all these layers and intricate things we're doing for that video. But all of our videos were storyboarded because we didn't have the time or the film or the budget to waste. It's not like shooting is with a storyboard makes it easier to shoot. You know, there's still challenges to face on the set, but at least you know what you're going for. You could not make this video without a storyboard. Like what? You're going to no. wing this? No. No way. Yeah. And you can't even write it down and say, oh, we'll throw a guitar in the foreground and then no. someone will be dancing on it. You need to know where everything is. Yeah. And so what we did is, you recall in the shoot, we had, um, I think it was a half a day or more, we, we just shot items. Like we clamped on the guitar and someone played it, but the guitar wouldn't move. Yeah. You know? And we, we built um, these little rigs so the microphone would turn and do these things. We even built, um, I think we used piano wire for oversized, and we built the strings so they would vibrate at the beginning of the video. Yeah. Um, the, we they weren't a inside effect. of a guitar. They're just no, hanging they were, out there. They were on, and we overlaid yeah. the guitar hole over those strings to make it seem like it yeah. was an acoustic guitar. It was about this big, I think. It was yeah. a rig with the six strings on it and using the largest piano wire. And someone built this little contraption out of steel. So And then one of you guys plucked it so it was on time. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when we were playing the song so fast, um, sometimes three times, four times, and Kelly was drumming to it. And um, I thought, Dan, this looks cool. That We've got the fans blowing, um, like the classic Bond, you know, with some fabric and a little bit of hair. Yeah. And Kelly is just rocking out like the song's going three times as fast, and he's right on the money. Yeah. He's exactly on. Yeah. And I remember you were damn, he's a good drummer. If he can play this song three times the speed. You know how the whole original idea came up was we were making the record in 95. And at some point during the record production, I was making a dub of an early version of it. Okay, but we, we had the slow tempo. And it was kind of like, I think it was like midday. Kelly was just waking up and he went into the TV room of this house where we were recording and he put on, he just turned on the TV and what it started playing was what was in the VHS machine, I think, which was The Spy Who Loved Me. But the sound was down and it was the song was playing and I had it at medium volume because because I w wanted to hear when it was done, so, and I would go back in and stop the dub. And so I mm -hmm. was in there talking to Kelly, and then I was looking at the screen, and I was hearing this song, and I was like, whoa. Mm. And Kelly was like, whoa, something's cool here. Something's really cool here. <laughs> <laughs> the, just the, the slow, just the, the cadence of the, the slow motion, um, the girls falling, and it just really synced up with that tempo, which is pretty pretty slow um, tempo. I remember distinctly, we both kind of looked at each other and we said, if we ever make a music video for this song, this should be our concept. And we right. we just kind of put a pin in it, and it was a year and a half, almost two years wow. later. And we had yeah. moved over to Warner Brothers, and they were like, this song is your first single. You don't have a say, and we want to make a video for it. We're going to go to radio with it. Good thing you hit me up about a year and a half after, because I don't think I would have known how to do this before, because I, I think it was around 95 when I made my first effects music video for Babes in Toyland, and that was through Pixel Farm, who also did Failure. And they approached me saying, do you want to do effects in a music video? And I had only done like in-camera stuff before that. And you know, coming from the punk, you know, era, all of that stuff. I'm like, what? That's cheesy. Why would you want to do effects? You know, that's like some bad TV commercial. But um, what I thought was really cool was like the old optically printed stuff. So I asked them to develop a way to make it look like a, use your modern technology, but don't make it look like it's past like 1972, you know? Go back in time and recreate it. And they came up with all these really intricate little details of, how to move things across the frame and still have an optically printed 24 frames a second way of doing that. And they had all these 
really complicated formulas that they had to invent. We tested a lot. And so by the time I got a word from Warner Brothers about this video, I'm like, I know how to do this. Well, I have a question for you, Ken. How did you find this footage? I mean, usually that stuff gets put in a vault and you never see it again. I don't even know if the labels keep it. How did you get the original 16 millimeter negatives? For some reason, the 16 millimeter negatives from this music video were kept with all of our tapes from the 90s. And when I say tapes, I mean boxes and boxes of two inch analog tape and also half inch mix down. So it's a lot of analog tape, boxes and boxes. And in one of those tape boxes, I saw a film can. And I was like, what is this? And I just pulled it out of the box and put it on the table. Mm -hmm. And like, there was harder fuller films, you know, can eight. And I was having a tough time figuring out how much footage there really was because mm -hmm. there was almost no documentation was with the negative at all. But I could mm -hmm. kind of peek in and see, no, oh, this is the Stuck on You music video. It's not anything else. It is that. Right. And it is 16 millimeters. So I took it to Photochem in Burbank, post-production services. I thought it was 2,000 feet. And they called back and they were like, no, it's 10,000 feet. It's a lot of film <laughs> because, yeah, and, yeah. and they were like, it looks like it's all slow-mo too. And I was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's because slow-mo, we eat up a lot more film. The film has to get up to speed. Tons of stuff is just getting ready to say action. Yeah. And you've already burned through like 30, 40, 50 seconds of film just to get to there. Yeah. And then cut and then shut it down. You already had this idea you were going to remake the music video. And I thought, are you nuts? This yeah. guy, that is like so complicated. How, how are you going to do this? And I was wondering why. And you said, well, the quality's bad. And it's never, you know, the way we thought it could be back when we saw it at Pixel Farm on their huge monitors. So is that why you did it? Because I'm super proud of that video. Everything about that video turned out the way I really hoped it would. From recording the song in 95 and having that original idea to being in post and Pixel Farm and going, wow, it actually happened. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. And then the frustration of trying to get a good SD transcode up to HD. It also synced up with us doing this redux of the first three 90s albums. And it was just all kind of made sense. Go back and redo everything from the 90s, basically. We did do a very first video from the second album. The film of that was not with the tapes. We don't know where that film ended up. Well, it's amazing you found it because your version is like better than I ever saw it. you did it note for note but what's nice about it it still keeps the organic 16 millimeter texture mm -hmm. um, so it's the best of both worlds and thanks for putting that back together yeah I couldn't believe it when I saw it I'm like oh my god this is better than I ever imagined it I did notice there was like some really cool, I think they're cool, they weren't in the original, but the, the 16 millimeter probably got scratched up a little bit over time. Just a couple places. I'm like, yeah, that's cool because it's real. Yeah. We know that's, that's film. <laughs> that's film, you know, and the only blatant spot is in the first verse where I'm th that long first lip sync shot of me. Should we fix those scratches? And I was like, mm, no, no. Hardly did any noise reduction or grain reduction, um, you know, pretty much left that in. Um, and once you get the colors and the smoke, the way that the smoke and the coloring, the moving smoke absorbs that grain, you know, that grain kind of just smooths out. The one thing that's a little different between the two videos is that there's a little bit more dynamic range now in the subjects just a tiny bit more detail in the hair and face. You put up a couple outtakes. We shot a lot of that on um, white with no filters, but I think with the smoke and some of the shots of you, we actually put on blue filters, I believe, in front of the lens. And so that, in some cases, maybe was where the color came from, or was all that color added in, in post? I can't quite recall. It was a mixture. The only color you really used in camera when you were filming some of the backgrounds, like a lot of the smoke was blue. You're jogging my brain. It may seem obvious now that you can kind of turn colors into anything with your home computer or whatever, 
but we had to go to a facility at a high price and all these things. We found out that if we shoot everything in blue filter, at least the, the stuff that would have had color, like the smoke, then they tested it and they go, hey, we can um, turn this to red, we can turn it to orange, we can turn it to green. So just do one color and we can um, shift it around. Okay, that, okay. That's why we use blue. It was a technical nightmare, but it was worth it. What I know with music videos is you can have the best idea, but if the song sucks, you just aren't going to go anywhere with yeah. your music video. <laughs> yeah. With that kind of powerful, beautiful, swelling song, you could probably shoot trash blowing down the, the street. And as slow long as in slow-mo. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for talking to me about the video, but I did want to talk to you about your new film, your new feature film that is just coming out right now called Tuscaloosa. Of course, it was going to be in all the cinemas, but we had to cancel that. Not surprising. But we um, left it on streaming services. It stars Natalia Dyer from Stranger Things, Devin Bostic, who's from uh, The 100. He was Diary of the Wimpy Kid, Okja. Um, Tate Donovan who was in Rocket Man and Argo and many television shows. And even the rapper YG, he plays a Black Panther back from Vietnam because it takes place in 1972, Alabama. It's based on a novel. This is my first narrative feature. It's a romance between uh, Natalia Dyer, who plays Virginia. A young woman is thrown into this institution against her will for what they say is quote unquote nymphomania. And a uh, young man, Billy, who smokes pot, taking a summer job after college. And he sneaks her out at night. They go to the seedier side of town. They go on all these adventures. It's just getting really great reviews right now. It's everywhere. It goes to iTunes and it's right there on the front page. So it's really getting a lot of exposure. It's happy to finally have made a movie. I mean, all those music videos, all that training, everything we did on the failure video, the storyboards, everything, the craft of filmmaking. I begged, borrowed, and stole everything I knew. I brought the whole production back to Minneapolis, just like we did your video, because I knew we could put it on the screen. And I knew the talent I was working with. A lot of the same people who worked on failure worked on this movie. Mm. It's out there, man. It's doing great. Well, it's really good to touch base with you again, man. Yeah, great to talk to you again, Ken, after 24 years. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> so yeah, check out Phil's new movie, Tuscaloosa, on streaming services. And thanks for watching this episode. I know it was kind of a different thing to focus on filmmaking instead of music, but as I like to work in both areas, this probably won't be the last time you see something like this. I hope everyone is doing okay and staying safe.